Welcome to Content with Character, the weekly podcast that'll give you the momentum you need to create content with more ease, clarity, and laughter. I'm your host, content copywriter Emily Aborn, and I'm all about unconventional marketing approaches. I believe in your big ideas, and I'm excited to help you share them in a way that's distinctly you. Welcome back to the Content with Character podcast. I'm so excited for today's episode as per usual. Actually, you know what? Today, excited is not the right word. I'm nerve sighted. Uh, I've been meaning to have this conversation with you for a long time. So I'm anticipatory. I'm nerve sighted, nervous, excited. Uh, and fair warning, I've been thinking about this for quite some time now. My thinking and processing, however, has only just begun, but I also realized I didn't want to wait any longer. We have to have the chat. We have to have the talk. We have to get started, lay a foundation, set a baseline. And I really want to start talking to you about this commonly overlooked factor of building a business and creating content, and that is being human. So on the heels of last week's conversation which was about bringing in more curiosity into our content, I thought now is the time. Now is the perfect time. And so over the next couple of weeks, I want to talk a little bit more about bringing in that human touch into our content. Like what does that even mean? What does it mean to be distinctly you? You know that can't quite put your finger on it kind of feeling, uh, you know, you don't know exactly what it is, but you love it and you're drawn to it, that kind of feeling, that je ne sais quoi, as they say in the beautiful French language, which I never ever have mastered despite living in France for four months. So that's kind of where we're going today. Today we're starting with like the showdown. We're going to do robots versus humans. And uh, I hope that in this conversation, you'll get a little clearer on how you want to use any robots, any AI tools that you do decide to use as the human being behind the business. So in addition to the thoughts and information I've been working on for this episode specifically, I'm also right now in the process of preparing for a panel event that I'm part of on April 30th, next week actually, where we're talking about using AI in content creation and how we do it to make our lives easier, but also what to consider, what you need to keep in mind when you do use AI in content creation. So with that, I've been kind of putting my feelers out there, trying to really learn and understand and watch what other people are doing because I want to know how other people are using AI in their content creation. I want to know how they're feeling about it. I want to know what they're already doing and what's working and also maybe what I see them not doing right or not doing well. Um, I'm also really close friends with someone who uses a lot of AI actually in helping her with her content creation. And she often shares with me various ways and ideas on how she uses it. So I love kind of bringing that into this conversation as well. I'm not going to obviously share her ideas with and claim that they're mine. Um, I'm going to just kind of bring some of these, these tools and resources and ideas into the conversation with you. And I'll say this, as a copywriter, one question I get asked frequently by my clients and by um, collaborators is, how do you use AI in your writing process? I've actually been working with quite a few clients lately who they don't want to sound like AI wrote their entire website. They want to sound like a human being, like they're realizing now it's more important than ever. And they want to set themselves apart by sounding like the one of a kind human being they are. So they hire me because they want that human touch in their copywriting. They want it to sound personal. They want it to have personality infused into it. Um, And they want it to sound like them while also speaking to the robots on the internet that are helping to drive traffic to their website, right? So there's an art and a science to it. Um, Now, other people I talk to do not share the notion of making it sound human. I'm actually part of this Facebook group and I saw somebody in there recently who posted about, uh, hey, do you have any recommendations for a good website copywriter? After reading through the comments, I actually did not end up putting my name in the hat because there were some comments in there that I was like, oh boy, (laughs) this is not my person. Um, But one of the comments, somebody's response was that they said, oh, I actually just used chat GPT to write my website for me. And it did a pretty good, and, I, and I'm quoting this, 
it, it did a quote unquote pretty good job overall. So somebody actually used ChatGPT to write their website copy and it did a pretty good job overall. I mean, that just baffles me. So we're going to take all of those parts and pieces that I'm kind of like, these are all the things flying around in the ether right now. And I'm going to bring all those together in this episode. And I also want to share with you, like, as we kick off, I want to share a story about a friend of mine that for the purposes of this episode, she's going to remain anonymous. But this is the story that really, I think, kind of tipped me over the edge and was like, all right, Emily, you need to sit down and talk about this topic, this issue, which is very prevalent right now in the content creation world. So my friend, you know who you are. Uh, if I mess up any details in telling your story, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know how I can be sometimes with fixating on one detail and forgetting others. So my friend is an expert in her field. Okay, we're going to call her Sally. Now, Sally is brilliant and she's spent a lot of time over the past, you know, lifetime <laughs> building her skill set. She's spent a lot of, in, she's invested in learning. She's invested in educating herself. Now, all of this is for the purpose of the work that she does now, being able to help other people, her clients. So here's what happened. Sally gets an introduction to somebody else who is not actually in her direct industry. It was kind of like a complimentary industry, okay? And this person had a podcast episode which was actually very specifically on her topic, her area of expertise. So somebody introduces Sally to this podcaster thinking that because he had an episode that was kind of in the same vein as her expertise, Sally should meet him so that she could either be a guest on his show or maybe even have him as a guest on her show. Because in the introduction, the person is thinking, oh, look, Sally, this guy's an expert at what you're talking about all the time. He would make a great guest for you or you would make a great guest for him. So my friend Sally, she's very good at vetting these things, and she goes off to find his show, downloads an episode. Now, as she's listening to the episode, she starts to recognize the, this very familiar language that he's using. First of all, she shares it's very generic, right? So a lot of the people in her industry use this kind of lingo. They sort of dole out the same like canned one size fits all advice in this specific industry that she's in. Well, secondly, as he gets going into it, she says, oh my gosh, it's a script. He's using a script and no joke. I don't care if you use a script. Uh, no joke, though, this script was not his own. It actually was something she had seen on chat GPT or, or Gemini. I don't remember which one she uses, but it was like verbatim, the exact answer that chat GPT had doled out to her the other day when she was asking it for feedback on something that she was working on and like checking to see if she was missing anything or something. Anyway, ultimately... She didn't end up using what ChatGPT or Gemini said because, well, it was generic and it was overused and it sounded cheesy and not really realistic to be applied to everyday life. Like it was just very, meh, no thanks, chat. Try again next time. But this guy, he's not an expert in this field, right? He's just doing one podcast on this area of expertise. So he goes ahead and uses that script verbatim. So he goes along in his episode just kind of like touching on this area of expertise, like covering it at really only a high level because it was apparent that he hadn't really asked a question to get it like any more deep into the topic. So personally, I was a little bit appalled be when she shared this story with me. I didn't realize, I, I think that there are more stories like this out there. Um, and it bothers me on multiple levels. Because I'm like, okay, when does it end? Like now we're having chat GPT write our episodes for us. So what's even the point of having the podcast? If it's not your unique opinion or personality or expertise, like I don't really get it. Um, but it, it bugged me. And it also bothered me because he veered out of his lane. Like that's not his area of expertise. But then he used AI to basically try to quote unquote, I'm just going to say like stand in for his own intelligence. Like he was like, well, I'll just borrow AI's intelligence because I don't actually possess it or have this in my repertoire. But then I'm going to talk like I do have this in my repertoire. So I don't know. That's where I'm coming from. 
I think that's enough said about the story. Um, and and where I want to take you is not this doom and gloom message. It's not a Debbie Downer message. It's not that all AI is bad. I will be sharing a couple of words of caution with you because I mostly, mostly what I want you to garner from this is I want to remind you of the importance of humanness personality in your content. That is like the way to make a connection. But then I'm also, of course, I don't want to leave AI out of the conversation and all of the value that it does have as a helper. So I'm going to suggest ways that you can use these tools as a helper without it crossing any sort of lines or getting blurry or you, you know, claiming that you have expertise or knowledge or quotes or verbs that you don't actually have. So by the end of this conversation, I really just want you to feel more like, you know what? I want to show up as me. I want to show up as human, uh, both online and also offline. And we're going to get into that a little bit next week too. How to like be really, really human like everywhere you go. Um, And really quick before we get into the nuts and bolts, I'm just going to take a moment to introduce myself before we get started. I'm Emily Aborn. Pretty sure I'm actually the only Emily Aborn, if you can believe that. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only Emily Aborn in existence, but I'm definitely the only one that pops up in a Google search. Check it out. Um, I'm a copywriter and content writer which means that I really help people's names and businesses get found in places like Google search. But I also help them to stand tall and proud behind their messaging because it feels like them. It's content and copy that looks, feels, and sounds like them. It shows off their personality, their values, and then it also connects them to clients that they love to work with too, other human beings that they love working with. So that's me in a nutshell, a little sprinkle of like my own personality, which obviously you can probably hear throughout the episode, but I'm a big lover of um, photographs actually. And I don't mean like the fancy artistic ones. I'm not talking like Ansel Adams or Annie Leibovitz. I'm talking about Photographs on my phone, like camera uh, photos I take on my on my cell phone. Also, some of the ones stuffed in the hairdryer box underneath my guest bed. I love looking at photos and reflecting on like happy moments in my life and just all of the stories that come through in photos that that they tell us without any words at all. So that's kind of like my little content fun fact. Um, I, it just popped into my head, but here's why: because it also relates to this episode around AI. Photos is another area I've seen AI become rampant. Like it's kind of like the wild, wild west out there. And as of now, I don't know about you, but when I look at an AI photo photo versus a, a real photo of somebody, I see a distinct difference. There is like this glimmer in people's eyes that just comes through in a real photo that does not exist in these AI versions, these AI headshots, if you will. So I want you to kind of keep that tucked away in the back of your mind too. Like, is the AI content actually even really able to show that glimmer, that little spark, you know? Okay. So that's my fun fact, that's my intro, and that is officially housekeeping over we're going in. You might need a hazmat suit, fair warning. Okay, so if you have zero idea what AI is when I refer to it and like what that even means, how it relates to content, copy, marketing, first of all, uh, yay you, I also wish I lived under a rock. No, just kidding. (laughs) I wish I had no idea what it was either, Uh, but I do. So let's quickly define it. And then we will go over a couple of the ways that it could be used, okay? Some some of the ways we might use it in our businesses. So AI is actually short for artificial intelligence, which is the simulation, that's an important word there, it's the simulation of human intelligence through a, ma- a machine. It allows machines to perform tasks that usually require human cognition, like learning, reasoning, problem solving, perception, and language understanding. I actually got that definition from AI itself. Uh, Okay, so AI, it does all sorts of things in all sorts of different ways. Basically, the goal is adding to human intelligence and or mimicking human intelligence. Now, chances are you probably use some of it even without knowing that you are. So for example, that predictive text feature in your in your text messages, that is AI. Autocorrect, that's another example. Um, PS, autocorrect, we never ever meant to type ducking 
<laughs> okay? It's never ducking. Um, Siri, Alexa, Hey Google, all of those things are examples of AI. Fraud detection at your bank, image recognition, all of that stuff. Now, it is making a bit more of an appearance as attempting to be a replacement for human intelligence versus just a tool or helper. So some of the ways that I've seen and heard people using them in their business right now, uh, content generation, that's a huge one. Now, this could be anything from ideas to outlines to rough drafts, repurposing, refining, editing for errors and typos. Some people even use it in an attempt to replace them actually having to do the actual content creation. More on that later. Um, the second way is actually like getting data and insights. That's a really common, popular way to use AI. Chatbots or automated responses. Maybe you've seen some of those on companies like um, customer service, right? Or you use them yourself on social media or on websites, things like that. And then also workflow optimization. So that would be like streamlining maybe those repetitious tasks. Um, everyday people like you and I use it. We use it for research assistance, ideation, uh, outlining, brainstorming, getting help solving problems and offering solutions, um, wording assistance, and like a kind of like a thesaurus sort of help, phrasing, sparking ideas, talking points, that kind of thing. So the key, and, and we are making this our foundation, the key is that it is in fact a fantastic helper, a great assistant. It is not a replacement for you. Now, I am admittedly a late adopter on like pretty much everything, uh, especially around technology. I'm also a little bit slow to change my ways and stubborn when it comes to a few things, skeptical when it comes to this, that, and the other. Um, but I'm not being stubborn on this. I'm being cautious and wary. And here's why. There's just a lot we do not know. And we are moving pretty fast despite not knowing all of those things. And we're not always looking at the big picture. Like, how is this big experiment going to end up. So I personally don't think that I can ever outsource my own creativity, my own human touch to a machine. That that may change. Uh, but right now, I don't think that I can outsource my creativity, my human touch to a machine. Personally, and this is just me, I don't really want to ever, okay? I don't want to ever. Even if that option comes along down the road, I don't really want to. I really respect and admire my brain's ability to create and ideate and like work through the natural, messy, sometimes painful process of creativity like our brains do. Um, and I don't ever really want to hand that journey off, that, that experience off to a machine. I don't also, additionally, I don't like being dependent on a tool that will help me create or write or brainstorm because I really, you know, I closely kind of identify with my brain's ability to be able to do that. So I don't really ever want to depend on something else to do that for me. Like I don't want to not be able to think of something because I'm always using this tool to think of something. And then this is like just totally personal. Um, I'm not really like a brainstorm with a friend kind of person. I do a lot of great brainstorming by myself. I might, once it's like more flushed, really flushed out, I might bounce the idea off one or two very trusted compadres, maybe, maybe. Uh, but sometimes I just go for things and then I like find out later that, okay, that was a bad idea. <laughs> or I wish I'd done this this way instead. But sometimes I get a lot of feedback once I'm just like in it and it's already up and running. It's just kind of how I roll. Um, so during my own ideation process, I don't like to start with AI. And then when I get stuck, when I need it, when I'm ready to maybe like move things on to the next step, the next level, I use it in very, very specific ways. That is just me. That's my process. And I'm what I'm sharing is not going to be right for anybody. Also, it's important to know, like, copywriting is my thing, right? So that is my zone. And I love doing it. It brings me a lot of joy. Um, I would actually be lying if I didn't say that I get a little mad <laughs> that everyone thinks they can just replace all the writers in the world with AI. And I would say I feel equally the same for musicians, artists, photographers, podcast editors, podcast hosts, coaches, therapists, like on and on and on. Like, AI cannot replace all of these people. It, it just, I don't like it. Um, so those are my personal thoughts. Those are my personal experiences. And now I'm going to actually share with you some 
real concerns that you should keep in mind when you are using it. And these are just kind of something to note in when as you're considering how you might use it. Um, you have to understand what you're doing and you also have to be mindful of how you're going about it when you are using these tools. Okay. Just because again, we don't know what's going to happen if these things get like wildly out of hand. Um, okay. So number one, I have uh, five of these for you to consider. I've worked with thousands of individuals over the past six years on copy and content like thousands of them. (laughs) No one has ever said to me, oh, I want my copy not to sound human. They never say, I want my copy to sound like a robot. In fact, every single time I read somebody's onboarding questionnaires, they want content that is warm or nurturing or quirky or conversational. They want content that makes people feel at ease, makes makes them as a business owner relatable. They want content that makes them human. And so, as of now, and this might just be me, but I think that human is actually the preference. So when you're thinking of your content creation, I think that people prefer it to be written or shared by a a human being. Um, Nothing I have ever personally asked AI to produce for me sounds exactly like me. And this is everything from transcripts, which are literally me, (laughs) Like literally, I will take a transcript of myself recorded. AI still doesn't exactly get the wording right, like how I exactly said it. Um, But also if I ask it for a prompt to, and I keep on prodding it, prodding it, prodding it to get it to sound like me, it actually, I don't feel like I'm reading my words or listening to my words. So now maybe not everybody is as weird as me, but I, I can almost always tell when somebody is just like kind of spitting out, regurgitating what AI gave them because it doesn't sound like them or or maybe it doesn't even feel like them. I don't know. I'll just say that. So that's my first sort of caution is just like paying attention to um, does this actually even really sound like me? And and if not, does it sound, does it have feeling to it, right? Does it have a, a connection in it? And you do have to ask yourself that question before you just take something that AI gave you and use it as your content. Um, Okay, my second number two thing to consider is ethics. It's an ethical thing. Um, If you copy and paste, or you copy paste and record yourself saying something that AI told you to say, and you don't disclose that that's what happened, so you don't say, you know, this is actually a chat GPT's definition, for example, like how you saw me do that. Um, It feels to me a little disingenuous inauthentic and unethical. I I mean, it's a little shysty, right? Like if I'm making people believe that that is my creation, my content, um, and not telling them otherwise, I think it's a little bit unethical. Um, I also think that there are other ethical issues involved in like maybe plagiarism or sharing misinformation or um, biases in what it gives you for information. Now, regarding plagiarism, specifically, it's up to you to double check whether something has, someone has already said this thing. Uh, I once saw somebody like right in front of my, like right in front of me, use this inspirational quote that they pulled from chat GPT. And they never once checked to see if that quote was actually something that somebody like a real person had said. So there was no attribution because quote unquote, the quote was from chat GBT, but they didn't know that they didn't check to see if that quote was attributed to an actual person. There's also that issue of misinformation, depending on which tool you're using, how you're using it, you have to do a fact check. Um, Here's a funny story to give you kind of like uh, an everyday example of this. So I actually had ChatGPT. I was trying to save myself some time and I wanted it to average these 30 numbers together. So I gave it all 30 numbers and it, and then I also confirmed it with a calculator and the answer that ChatGPT gave me was wrong. It was incorrect. And I had it redo it several times and it came back with, an ad- with a different answer Every single time I put the numbers in and I was like, oh my goodness gracious. So you do have to check to make sure that the information that it's giving you is correct. I mean, that was just straight up. That was math. It was math and it was totally wrong. So I ended up actually just doing the average in Excel and it made it perfectly right. Um, But I could not believe it. So 
realize that, that um, you do have to fact check. Some of the information in the tools are outdated because uh, they came out at certain times and haven't updated or you might be using an old version. Anyway, some of the information is outdated. Some of it's just like plain old wrong. Um, I personally would prefer and I think that this is going to be a rule soon, but I would prefer that people disclose if they're going to be using AI and also like how they're using it, uh, because I think that overall that's the more ethical approach. And I have no problem in sharing with you when I do it. So for example, in this episode, one of the things I did ask ChatGPT was to help me come up with some ideas on why people shouldn't be using AI. So I said, I have these three ideas and I could use two more. Did I copy and paste what it gave me? No, I used its ideas. I formulated my own thoughts and my reasons and built my points around it. But I did look at those top ideas that it gave me like what should I really be aware of when I'm using AI and then I kind of like narrowed it down you know parsed through it all that another great example of where you have to do another step or you have to kind of double check is using um, ChatGPT or Gemini or whatever tool you use to do quote unquote SEO keyword research so people have told me oh I do all my keyword research in ChatGPT and I hate to break it to you, but coming up with keyword ideas, that's one piece of it. That is one piece of the puzzle. Um, That's a fraction of SEO keyword research process. So there's like a lot more steps that are involved than just getting the keyword ideas. So don't even get me started with that. That's an entire episode for another day. But with those keywords, you then have to take them, know if you even stand a chance ranking for them, know how to use them, where to use them, the strategy behind them, who's actually searching for those keywords, who your ideal client is. Like there's so much more to consider. So I think that's just a piece of making sure that what you're sharing, what you're using, what you're pulling from it is actually accurate. Also, are you um, being, are you opening yourself up to plagiarism, biases? Uh, We already talked about misinformation. And then are you using it in an ethical way? Um, Bouncing off of ethics is my third, my third caution. And that's um, copyright infringement, trademark and intellectual property of other people. So similar to plagiarism, but kind of different, you do need to be aware of whether or not you're um, crossing any legal lines. I am 0% expert on this, 0% information. Uh, So I'm just going to like stop right here on that point. But I think that's enough said, like you do not want someone coming for you. So you have to pay attention to the copyright infringement, trademark, intellectual property laws around whatever you're using. Okay. And lastly, um, I would say, oh, no, two more. Sorry. Uh, Privacy and security. I mean, it's important to consider, like, what am I giving this thing? <laughs> what what information am I giving this thing? Now, here's, a, here's something I don't know if everybody knows. You most certainly should not be giving AI tools your client's name. Um, you should not be giving it any personal information. You should not be giving it sensitive data. And people should be thinking twice about how much actual privacy they're divulging to these things. Also, maybe the security of these things. Again, not my wheelhouse. I am no hacker. (laughs) Like I'm not a hacker or computer tech nerd or anything, but I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but it's just a word of caution. It's just a word of caution. Uh, How's the privacy? How's the security? No big deal if you're just looking for content creation ideas, right? But depending on how you're using it. Okay. Um, And number five, Google is not a fan. This is important. Um, Google is not a fan of spammy, shysty content. Search engines, I should say, are not fans of spammy, shysty content. They don't want things that people aren't interested in. So they want, what they're looking for is helpful content. They want content that people are actually going to read and enjoy and actively search for. That's the kind of content content they are giving preference to. Um, Google specifically uses an acronym called EEAT. That stands for experience expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And I I was recently reading this article about AI content not really standing up well to this algorithm. Now, I do SEO copywriting in my copy, um, but if you want to know more specifically about the Google algorithm, search engine optimization, really specifically, 
I would love for you to check out my colleague Erin Alila's Talk Copy to Me podcast because she talks a lot about this and I know that she spoke specifically to that EEAT algorithm. So I'll make sure I include a link to that in the show notes. Erin really knows her stuff on what the search engine gods like and what they disregard as spam or junk. But it's just another instance of how, you know, when you're using copy or content that is AI generated, maybe you want to think twice before just copy pasting it and running with it. And you ask yourself, like, is this actually content that I'm am, like, basically, what's the point? Is this just content for content's sake? Or is it actually going to be helpful content for people? Is this going to be seen well in the uh, in the eyes of Google seen looked upon with favor? So to sum it all up, these tools in general, are meant to be used as assistants. They're not you replacements. I absolutely love how my friend Alicia says this. She is the host of the Listeners to Leads podcast. She says, and I'm not going to get this like word for word, but she says it's like your assistant, okay? It's not the CEO. This is kind of like your um, your secretary or your executive assistant, but it's not a replacement for you, the president. So you want to use it to help you do your job better. You want to use it to help you make your decisions better, to make your life easier, but you're not giving it every single task, every single decision that you should really be the one responsible for doing. So here are some ideas I came up with with how people are using it, how you can use it to make your life easier, and then we'll kind of just real quick wrap up. Um, Number one, and these are specific to content creation, okay? Okay, number one, I use this a lot. Um, I will take a transcript of my podcast episode, uh, this is actually an idea from my friend Alicia Galati of the Listeners to Leads podcast. So she said, hey, Emily, with your solo episodes, you should upload them into AI. That's a, that, uh, sorry, Otter AI. It's a transcription tool. And you can then ask it for like the five highlights of your episode or how you might restructure this into a LinkedIn newsletter or article or repurpose it into a blog. So I really like that. You can also ask it to pull out quotes or to pull out highlights or to summarize it and like help you with show notes, right? I never actually, you know, I'm a little bit of a wild card. I don't use, I could never use verbatim for sure what it gives me, but I also really, really like work it and make it my own. But I might use the five points that it gives me as the main basis for like my, my newsletter or my article or my email or whatever I'm doing. So that's a really good idea. Um, taking a transcript and saying like, "Ooh, how else could I use this? Like, how could I repurpose this into something else with the words I've already actually even I've, I've already spoken. But reminder, you have to rehumanize it after it robots it. OK, uh, number two is show notes. I just kind of mentioned that, but that's a really good one. Like it, I, I still think you need to end up writing the show notes, putting the final touches on them. But you can use the AI generated show notes as a springboard. You could even like copy and paste your episode into an AI tool and be like, hey, can you give me some show notes for this? I don't use it for this. Um, I really like writing show notes. My show notes, that explains why my show notes are like a roller coaster, right? I think. But uh, show notes is a good one. Um, okay, templates. This is a really good one. So let's say you have a blog structure or an email structure or a portfolio page or a project page, something you repeat every single time you do it. Like it's a very basic, oh my gosh, every time I do my show notes, they look exactly like this. Any rinse and repeat thing you need, you can actually ask ChatGPT or Gemini or whatever tool you like to use. Um, you can say, hey, can you help me create a template that I can use every single time for my podcast or even for the tasks associated to my podcast, right? Like it's actually really, really helpful for like an SOP, like a standard operating procedure or a template. So you might not use the exact template it gives you. You might use the exact template it gives you, but now you're still having to fill in the pieces. It just gave you the uh, framework, right? The, the outline. Um, speaking of outline, number four is outlining. I actually really love it when my ideas on a topic are all over the place and I know I need a little bit of structure in how I'm sharing the concepts because I could talk and talk and talk and talk as you may have learned from this podcast. Uh, I was really good at outlining in school. 
It was easy though. There was a five paragraph essay or whatever structure and order the teacher gave you. So bada bang, bada boom. I loved outlining. Um, but now sometimes, you know, with all of the ideas we have, it can get a little like chaotic, right? So I do love using um, ChatGPT. Per- personally, my preference is ChatGPT, just me. Um, but I use it for like helping me with an outline, helping me with a, a blog, or if I have like a whole month and I'm like, here's like 90,000 ideas for the month. How can I actually focus this into one theme? Uh, and can you help me outline all the ideas out? So I might use it in that. Um, I didn't use it in today's episode, which is probably why today is one of my less structured episodes. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I like having a structure. I like having like kind of a loose outline, a place I'm taking you, like where I'm going and how I'm going. Um, idea number five is idea generation. And this is where you need to be cognizant not to cross that line into having it do it for you. Only you can determine where that line is. Only you probably know where that line is. But um, here's an example of like what could be idea generation. So you might say, hey, Gemini, I'm writing a blog on how to dress large windows. What are some things I should consider when I'm choosing window treatments? You might actually end up wanting to be more specific with it. Okay, so what are the three... What are the three things I should consider? What three things does a homeowner need to know prior to dressing a large window? You can get deeper in on questions around each of these. You can have it give you more insight. You can ask it, am I missing anything? These are my ideas so far. Um, But I would, again, like I'm just going to repeat this. You can't just cut, paste, great. That all sounds good. Let's run with it. You have to make it your own. You have to make it your own copy, both in your voice and your tone and in the um, exact verbiage that you're using. Um, Number six is a thesaurus tool or like, how do I say this in another way? Okay. Now I'm notoriously terrible at common turns of phrase. I mess them up constantly. <laughs> like I never know what the actual phrase is. I blame uh, homeschooling when I was growing up. So anyway, because I mess up turns of phrase often, <laughs> I might say to a chat GPT, what's the common way people would say this? Or am I using this metaphor right? Am I using this phrase right? And then sometimes if it's like, no, or if I'm like, well, I could think of a more fun way I could actually say this. I might say like, can you help me come up with a more fun way to say, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And it will come up with more ideas around that. So, okay, but I'm going to confess to you, I don't tend to actually use what it says because Usually it's something I wouldn't say or it's really cheesy. Uh, And oh my God, let me just tell you, these tools can be really, really cheesy sometimes. But what it does do is help to spark ideas for me to think of my own silly way to say something or another creative path I could take. Um, And I really like that. Like sometimes, you know, that's like, I'm not going to text my husband in the middle of his work day and be like, how do I say this (laughs) in a different way? I just like having this as a tool to help me get that in about five seconds flat. Um, Okay, I've got three more for you and then we're wrapping up. There are things uh, keyword wise and hashtag wise that you can use these tools to get you started with. So here's an example. People might say, um, they might plug in like, what are some potential keywords I should be researching? I could be researching for my interior design website. What are some potential keywords people might look up to work with a copywriter. But then you can't stop there. You can't just take those keywords, whatever it's spewed out at you, and use those because you don't actually know if you're going to be able to rank with those keywords or like what, you know, some of those keywords might have connotations you don't want to be associated with. So you actually have to do that next step. And like, there's actually like six next steps um, that you have to actually have to do those next steps see if that's a keyword you even want to use and uh, do a little bit more legwork in there. So the other thing I've seen people do is like get it for hashtags. So like what are 30 hashtags related to the content of this post? But again, you're going to want to make sure that um, all of those hashtags are things you actually want to be associated with your account. Uh, Hashtag not all hashtags are equal. Not all hashtags mean what you think. Um, And you're also going to want to make sure that's like a hashtag that you actually even think would be speaking to your ideal client. 
So those are those are great ways to use it for ideation, but maybe not just like take it and run with it. Um, okay, last two. The second to last is ideal client research. I like this. Um, you can kind of describe this ideal client that you are looking to speak to. And you can have it ask you questions. So I can say, hey, ChatGPT, I want you to pretend that you are an interior designer um, who works with clients on Long Island and you work exclusively on kitchen and bath design. I can actually have chat ask me questions as a copywriter or whatever I want to, whatever I'm trying to convey to it. I can have it ask me questions as that ideal client. I can also ask it questions as that ideal client. So I can be like, tell me about your morning or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But you can um, help it to paint a demographic and psychographic description of your ideal clients and also like get to really understand a little bit more of what do they want? What are they trying to do? Uh, spoiler alert, this is not going to come as any surprise to you. This doesn't replace actually talking to your ideal clients or talking and getting information from people you work with. Okay, this is just idea generation. Um, lastly, I know a lot of people who use AI for repurposing, and we talked about that a little bit in my first point, but turning podcasts to blogs, blogs to podcasts, emails to whatever. So there's a lot of time saving opportunities in there. There's a lot of repurposing you can do with, um, AI. Now there's a lot of other time saving ideas I've heard too. And I, and I think they're great. Like you can ask it to organize your day with time blocking. You could tell it like everything you need to get done in a day. You can have it make a grocery list based on what you want to eat for dinner. You can have it create a workout plan, even a week of meal planning. Um, you can ask it for a list of potential talk topics that you could talk about in your business or that your ideal client would be interested. There's a lot you can do. And I am not bashing it. I want to reassure you or, or make sure you know that. I'm reminding us that we do still need to be cognizant of how we're using it. Proceed with caution. And just remember that it's not a replacement for you, the creator, the human. Um, and then on a deeper level than that, I would also ask you this. If you are just looking for it to replace you uh, and have everything that it comes out with be copy and pasteable, my question for you would be like, but why? Like, why are you doing that in the first place? What is the point? Because in my opinion, as a content and copy person, uh, content for content's sake that's not actually probably going to work with you. It's, it's certainly not the strategy I would encourage people to be chasing um, or, or doing. Uh, so I am not about encouraging people to just mindlessly create more copy, mindlessly create more content, more, 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 more digital marketing. In fact, I know that that feels like the fast and easy track. It feels like, oh, that's the the quick path to success and growth, right? Digital marketing, no human interaction necessary. I can just post and blog and podcast and people will come flocking to me. Uh, but that's not the right assumption. That is that is incorrect. It is actually, if you decide to go solely no human contact whatsoever, I, it's the longer road. I think building a human business is actually ends up being it feels slower when you look at it on paper, right? But it's actually a faster way. It's a deeper way. It's a better way. And, and it's more sustainable over the long term to have a relationship-driven business, a business in which you're actually connecting with other people. Like you're being human with other humans, uh, real, honest, authentic, genuine, vulnerable, if you want to borrow all that overused jargon to describe the phenomena. I don't know. But I think that being a part of a community, collaborating with others, forging those lasting partners and relationships, that is still winning. Being human is still winning for most of us. And that is how you're going to grow a successful business over the long term. No matter what, there's no fast. It's, it's all a long game. Um, but that is still faster than digital marketing alone. So on that note, I want to wrap up. I want to give you two resources one is specific for my fellow podcasters, and that is my friend Alicia Galati's podcast productivity power-up mini course. She uses AI to 
repurpose a podcast episode into 10 plus engaging pieces of content across multiple platforms. So I'll make sure the link to that is in the uh, show notes. And the other one I want to share is a new podcast or a rebranded podcast, I should say, by Andrea Jones. She just started, she turned her Savvy Social podcast into the Mindful Marketing Podcast. And I want to include the link in the show notes to that too, because I think, and Andrea shares this prediction. I think that um, real connection, real human content, that's the kind of content that is going to be sought out. And it might just be my wishful thinking, but as of now, that is what I think. That is what I believe. I think we prefer real and we tend towards content that is real over, over robot written, robot created. Does art have the same power if it was created by an all-capable machine that took five seconds versus years of talent and inspiration and blood and sweat and tears and angst? Does a a book written by AI have the same lure? Does a movie created by AI provide that same wow factor? Is the acting just as great? I don't know. I don't know if I have the answers to these questions, but until I do... I just want to keep on encouraging us to bring back our human side, bring it into everything we do in our business, in our content, in our marketing, you name it. Because right now, being a human is at an all-time premium. And I think that that is just going to continue. So keep on sharing those idiosyncrasies, sillinesses, quirks, burps, failures, stories. Keep connecting with other people who feel the same. Learn about yourself. Learn about yourself deeply. Learn about your clients deeply. Be the one who stands out by listening and truly caring. Get clear on what you stand for, who you are, what your mission and vision is, and really show your heart. Be distinctly you whenever possible because you, being human, that's your secret sauce. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Content with Character. If you loved the episode, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast, rate, review, and share it with someone else you know it could help. For more content and visibility tips, visit my blog at emilyaborn.com. And be sure to connect with me on Instagram at emilyaborn. I'd love to hear how this inspired you to take action.